Hi everyone, I'm Florence Ferry Alt and I'm happy to be here again with you today to discuss some more beautiful dolls that we're going to be talking about, showing, demonstrating, and these dolls are from the collection of Ursula Breck, a very famous collector from Germany, and we've entitled the catalog for her dolls, Bread and Roses. And before I show you that some more, for those of you who have collected doll books over the years, if any of you recognize these two doll books, these were both books done of her dolls in the 1980s. Ursula Breck has been collecting since early 1960s and has had the ability to find and um, obtain some very, very wonderful dolls that are virtually unavailable on the market anymore in great original costumes. So we're going to be showing many of these today. Uh, what we show amount to a small fraction of the wonderful dolls in her collection. There are over 425 dolls in the auction catalog, and we'll be showing you some of the, her very favorites over the years, many of which are photographed in these original books she did. I wanted to read you something from our introduction to our catalog, which I took from her writing in her original book. And let me tell you about the background of this and see if it gives any of you chills the way it did to me. Ursula Breck wrote this, during my childhood, before World War II, I was allowed to rummage through the attic in our home in Germany. I was fascinated by all the old boxes and trunks. They held so many mysteries that going through them was always an adventure. One day, I found a trunk filled with silk and lace dresses from my grandmother's childhood. I took out the dresses and I found an old jointed doll lying among them. She had a delicate, finely molded porcelain head, expressive glass eyes, and a disheveled curly wig. Her trousseau was in a small wicker hamper. It was filled with beautiful hand-sewn dresses, lace shirts, frilly stockings, and ankle-length boots. They were items that a mother would have used 50 years earlier to dress up her doll, to dress up her daughter. The doll was a dream from a bygone era, and she filled me with wonder. She became the center of my fantasies. I spent hours inventing stories about her. Sadly, these games ended with the war. Our house was destroyed during a bombing raid. Along with any, everything else, I lost the doll but I never lost my hope of finding another. In her book, it, just, it gives me chills even when I've read it so many times. In her book, Ursula Breck wrote how the years passed. She grew up, she got married, she had children of her own, and it turned into like the, the mid-1960s. And she was, some years later, about 1965, her family was now raised, and Ursula Breck was walking down a street in Cologne, and she spotted a shop window which displayed about 20 dolls. She said, I stared at the window, then entered the shop. I picked up the dolls one by one. I moved their arms and legs. Once again, I fell under the spell cast by my playmate so many years ago. I felt like a child standing in front of a Christmas tree. And so the collection began. We all know that story. Every one of you who loves dolls have had your own version of that story in your life too which is probably what brought you to collecting. Ursula was a careful collector. She studied and studied and studied. In her original book, she writes about how she put so many hours into pursuing knowledge. Into, as time went on, she was able to travel throughout Europe and find different sources for dolls. Also, the wonderful corollary of the many friends she made and the many people who gave her advice and wisdom. And so we're here to share with you some of her beautiful dolls. She's now decided it is time to part with her dolls and move them into the hands of other collectors. We entitled our catalog Bread and Roses because roses were the other abiding passion of Ursula Breck's life, and we decided Bread and Roses were a one, was a wonderful title to present her dolls because that's really what dolls bring to many of our lives. They are our daily sustenance, and they're also the beauty and the roses that fill our life. So let's begin. And fashion dolls were a particular favorite of Ursula Breck. 
Uh, she loved the lady dolls with all of their costumes and accessories, and every one of hers has not only rare bodies and beautiful faces, but extraordinary original costumes and accessories. Now, when we think of French poupées, we tend to think of the bisque dolls that were made starting in the 18, early 1860 period. <clears throat> but prior to that, there were other fashion dolls that were made in France. Uh, one of the makers of them was actually a German fellow who went to France um, early in the 1800s, and he began making paper mache dolls, doll heads, much as he had made in his native Germany. And this is an example of an Andreas Voigt paper mache doll head. Now, when you look at her, those of you who are not advanced collectors might say, oh, she's kind of worn out and that gown is kind of disheveled and all. It doesn't matter. She is so extraordinary. To find these early dolls in their original costume is so incredible. I'm going to turn it around so you can see all the way around the back. And then I'm going to tilt it up so you can see her wonderful hat and the work that was done on that. The doll is wearing her totally original costume. She would be from about the 1830 to 1840 period. Enamel eyes, her little kid body, very similar to the French uh, fashion bodies that are made later. Only if you look at these bodies carefully, you see they're completely hand stitched. The work that went into them was extraordinary. Now look at this. I'm going to lift her skirt a little bit and I want you to see her wonderful matching slippers and please notice the wooden stand that she is on. This is the original stand that was sold with the doll when she was um, first made and to find these is, is just really wonderful today. So here she is in all of her wonderful glory. Look at this just one more thing. Look at the, her hat at the top. Her original wig is very dusty, but that's the way the coiffure was at the time. Never been played with. Wonderful doll. In the 18, late 1850s and then into the 1860s, the magical name for designers of poupées was Adelaide Hooray. The Hooray family were notable for their furniture making, and they made just wonderful uh, metal furniture decor uh, finished with a lot of needlepoint and wonderful tapestry covers on them. And Adelaide Hooray was a daughter of the original makers and she wanted to branch out in her own part of the industry. So she started out by making miniature models of the furniture, doll size models, and moved from there into making dolls that would be um, displayed with this miniature furniture. Her doll was very, very distinct. It has wonderful, I have here three examples of the wonderful Hooray poupées that are in the Ursula Breck collection. And they're all notable. If you look at their eyes, you will see wonderful things that, that are very identifiable about Hooray's and one of the ways you can absolutely pinpoint them. In the lower part of their eyes, there's like a decorative glaze on the lower part of the eyelid. Gave, gives them a very, very unique look Dream, very dreamy-eyed kind of look. And those of us who are trying to identify dolls today, if they don't have a signature, that's one of the cardinal points for recognizing a hooray. I think this particular example shows it beautifully. And in all of these dolls, I want to point out to you their wonderful accessories. She, this particular example is holding beaded, a bouquet of beaded flowers. She has a wonderful purse. And she has her watch with her chatelaine. And I'm going to show you her hat with detail. And I do want to show you her wonderful shoes that are signed, Hooray à Paris. And I will try to lift one of these feet up so you can see it very clearly. We look at the Hooray faces today and we really admire those. At the time, understand that Hooray designed a body for her dolls that was very, very unique, and it was made out of a gutta perca material, which is a type of a rubber material. Very, very unique model. Um, also, sadly, very perishable. And it's so very difficult to find them today. Most of them over the years, beginning back 1870, 1875, were, had their bodies replaced with 
the wooden dowel jointed bodies that are almost exact, exactly the same models as the gutta perca. And all of these have the wooden bodies that have been on them for, well, I guess 150 years at this point, um, as opposed to the gutta perca bodies, which I always thought collectors would say, oh, I want the original body that was on it, but actually they, most people don't because they're just so terribly fragile. And these wooden bodies are able to have all of the wonderful articulation that you like to have when you're posing your fashion dolls. Another beautiful example here, and then this one, I don't know which one of the three would be your favorite, but I kind of lean toward her because I think her eyes are just so stunning. And she also has, I would like to point out, her original signed hooray shoes in a very unusual aqua kid color. And let me just turn her around so you can see her costume all the way around. Oh yes, what a beautiful dreamy look to those eyes. This is the style of costume that was deliberately designed for the hooray poupee, which really represented almost more of a child. The style of costume was called mode enfantine childhood styles and they were not really ladies they were these little full dresses look at the little parasol she carries it's absolutely wonderful so we have those three by madame Pere. and more wonderful poupees from the ursula breck collection we have this very very beautiful girl right here with very pale bisque she has an all wooden fully articulated body so much of the experimentation with the poupees that was being done related as much to their bodies as to their heads. They wanted to come up with a doll that would have um, able to be articulated, able to be dressed and undressed. If you recall the first doll I showed you here, the paper mache doll, that was never designed for a child to play with and dress and undress. It was designed to be a showpiece. Now we have doll makers wanting to say, no, the children need to play with them. This one is wearing a superb antique costume this wonderful uh, silk tassel sash, beautiful fan with the blue tassel tie on it and the wonderful hand-painted detail. And when I turned her around, I know you saw her very, very beautiful bonnet and I want to tilt her up so you can see that a little more. Many of the, most of the poupées in the Ursula Breck collection have the wooden bodies, which are then, or beautiful bisque hands, which are able to be articulated. And I think that means so much in the presentation of our poupées. A small doll, because mo although mo the standard size for poupées became the 17 inch size, with some being 16, some being 18, but mostly right in that range, because as you can imagine, it's not unlike American girls or Barbie dolls today. The market the secondary market for selling costumes and accessories was as big as selling the dolls themselves. So to have a standard size doll was a much better uh, marketing approach for the doll makers of the time than to have 20 different sizes. But occasionally a wonderful little rare doll like this gorgeous little girl shows up and she has everything from her little leather purse that she's hair carrying here on her shoulders, to wonderful leather boots, to even her hooped petticoat, which keeps her, um, her little rounded skirt, her little childlike skirt puffed out, a very, very gorgeous doll. Another wonderful example, um, this one with the kid over bisque upper arms, and then, our kid over wood upper arms, and then the bisque lower arms, so you could have this beautiful shaping of the hands. And if you see the hands, how wonderfully they're modeled with the separate fingers and curled ever so delicately. She's holding her little parasol, which is wonderful. And she has just really extraordinary boots. And I hope you're able to see them because that was, that was a whole industry in the doll market as well, was the making of these little accessories. And there were some makers who specialized in boots, some in parasols, some in jewelry. And to have a wonderful pair of boots for your doll was almost as important as having them for yourself. The next one, one of my particular favorites, because I think she has the most expressive character-like face. Very, very wonderful features, showing off that piquant little smile, but those little plump cheeks. She also has a real bonus 
she has the dehors articulation of her neck. Now let me tell you exactly what that means. That means she not only can turn her head side to side, swivel, which other dolls can, but she can tilt forward. She can tilt her head side to side and the position will hold. So when Dehors talked about the, his patent and what, what, why he tried to have this special neck articulation, he said he wanted the doll to be realistic, as though she weren't just turning her head in this kind of frozen manner, but she could have very, very expressive posing of the face. Other makers came along and started uh, making that articulation, but he was the first. So this doll to me, great because she does have her superb kid over wooden upper arms with a bisque lower hands. She has a very almost mint kid body. She has the rare neck articulation and the face. Wow, that face is unbelievable. And I think her costume is pretty special too, not to mention the little necessaire that she's carrying. So in case it would come upon her, if she's visiting a friend that she pulls out her needlework and starts doing a little needlework, she has all of her supplies ready. These little valuable accessories are so hard to find and they're, they're just to be cherished and even wonderful boots. So continuing on with our little study of the wonderful fashion dolls from the Ursula Breck collection, we have four examples of fashion poupées that were created from the firm of Leon Casimir Brew. What he's most famous about in his fashion dolls, what people most know him for, was the model that is known as the Smiling Brew, with a very piquant yet enigmatic smile. People used to call it the Mona Lisa Brew because it has that type of a smile, which describes the smile well, but is not really a great name for the doll. But at any rate, um, that doll evolved, actually. He had several versions of it. One of the ways the doll is marked is it usually will have a letter number on the back of the head and on the shoulder plate, and the letter will be designating um, the size of the doll. A, B, C, D, E, F. I think I've seen a G once to a considerably large one. Now this is the earliest version of, of his smiling brew. It does not have the very distinctive smile that the later ones have that I will show you but it's, it's very recognizable. Also, you will find what is distinctive about these dolls, whereas most fashion dolls, when the kid body was put on the doll, it's, it's like a semicircle right, um, right on the upper part of the chest. The kid poupee was squared off. So it was, I, we call it the square co co kid collarette. Um, so that's very distinctive if you're trying to identify them and then always look for the letters. And then, you do have this wonderful here, just a hint of a smile. This was obviously one of Ursula Breck's very, very famous dolls. I want to show it to you because she not only did her books, but she created a series of calendars throughout the 19, 18, late, 18, late 1980s and 1990s. And this was her 1999 calendar in which she is featuring this fashion doll, clearly one of her very favorites. And when I turn this costume around and show it to you now, you're going to see why this doll is wonderful. By the way, in case you can't see it, all fully wooden body, fully articulated, with the famous brew design that not only has the dowel jointing at shoulders, elbows, wrists, hips, knees, sometimes ankles, but also has the ball swivel waist. This was an almost exact copy of the artist mannequin body that had been made for a century or more in Europe, and he took that and refined it, made so uh, soft curves in it and wonderful finish to it, and made that the basis of his body style, which he actually deposed. So here we have this, and let me turn it around and take a look at all of the features of this extraordinary gown. And then I'm going to bring it around again. And I'm going to show you her beautiful little ivory slippers that are very, very similar with little heels on them, but very much like the hooray type slippers. But these are ivory silk slippers. She has a wonderful bonnet. She has jewelry. And she's just extraordinary in every way. One of the ways, by the way, just little things when I think of, I want to throw them out to you. Pierced ears. When the earliest of the poupées, the ears will be pierced directly into the head. 
So there, it's like a little hole going into the head. As the pupae's evolved and then into the bebe's, actually the earlobes are more defined and the piercing will be in the earlobe and not into the head. So when you're trying to date your period of your pupae, that's one of the things you can look at. Continuing with the smiling brew, we have this wonderful little example. Again, an all wooden body, you see? Just wonderful for posing. Beautiful flowing mohair wigs. They call this style flotant in his advertising, which I love, it's like floating hair. And again, all wooden body and this beautiful dotted Swiss original costume the little demi train in the back and as you see you'll see with many of the dolls from the Ursula Breck collection she liked to pose them holding their own little all bisque doll most of them in their original little toffling outfits and that's what this one is later in about 1870 Brew actually evolved his smiling face and he deposed the actual facial model. Um, I like to tell the story when I was working with Francois Timer on the Brew book, we were just going to press and he called, he said, stop the presses because they found, he and his wife Danielle found in the French courts, the original deposed model of this very distinctive and particular face um, with the well-defined model. And so, um, that's been, it, it was just an extraordinary discovery because even though collectors have always called this brew, there was really never any reason they did except they sort of knew it was brew. Now there was the final proof. Um, again, two good examples here and what I really love about them is um, the one right here, and I'm going to turn it around because I want you to see her hair all the way around. It has, I hope the camera will be able to pick it up because it's almost hidden on her hair, but she has this wonderful original snood, net snood at the back of her hair that captures the back but lets these curls tumble out at the front and that has never been off her head. And speaking of never having been off, this costume is the costume that she was, so to speak, born with. She's been wearing it ever since and very, very stylized. I've seen this actual costume on a brew poupee three different times now. Um, the same costume in, in slightly different color shades, but it must have been one of his particular favorites in which he presented the doll one year. And when people keep talking about research that needs to be done, it must have represented some particular occasion. And I hope someday someone will come across a historic photograph of an occasion in which this gown was being worn and we'll know what it was. We have another very lovely one here. And our, this little girl, little lady, is also holding her own little all bisque bebe in its original bunting. And she also has her little necessaire, her little sewing necessaire. So she is ready to take care of things wherever she goes on her walk. She's wearing her totally original gown with matching bonnet as well. And I'm gonna show you her wonderful little boots when we bring her back around again. I think Ursula Breck loved shoes because all of her dolls have the most wonderful shoes, many of them with the original maker's initials and stamp on them. 